Welcome back to Morning Trade Live. We've got more than 10 minutes till the opening bell to set the stage for this week, which is full of economic data, including inflation, a few lingering earnings that should be some fun, too, some cloud companies, and, of course, we're watching retailers see how they trade after the big holiday numbers. Let's bring in Peter Anderson joining us to kick things off. He's a founder at Anderson Capital Management. Peter, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Hey, you've got a turn of phrase in the notes you sent over that I don't often get in my guest notes. It's that you're having the best year of your life. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, I entered into 2023 with the idea that everybody's too over-focused on the Fed, the tightenings, is that going to slow the market down, et cetera. And now we're at the end of this year, and I have to tell you, my opinion is still the same, that there has been all this year, there was way too much over-focus on the Fed tightening. And uh, really, as we saw, markets have really survived this whole year. And lucky for me, I've picked the right stocks this year that I'm having a very strong year. In fact, the, probably the best year of my career. So go figure. All right. Well, congratulations. What's the uh, winning recipe here? I mean, I know from our conversations that we've had that you've retained that uh, sort of realistic optimism without getting too like over the skis on like the hyper speculative stuff. Just saying, hey, stick with the quality companies. We're going to make it through here. What's paid out the most? Oh, well, of course, NVIDIA, but, you know, I've been a follower. I'm not a late adopter of NVIDIA, uh, Oliver. I have been a fan for almost 10 years now. So that is one of the top holdings. But, you know, the other thing is just the themes of this. Growth stocks, we've heard ad nauseum for the past two years. Everybody's been afraid of investing in growth stocks. Why? Because of some mathematical element about discounted cash flows and present values. Of course that matters in graduate school when you're getting your MBA, but when you're actually looking at real companies, I don't think that's the main factor about what values a company. There are many other things. How about just talking about raw sales, the top line, for instance? Mm. So is that then a message about the nominal level of the interest rate that it doesn't have to keep a lid on the stock market or is it like a rate of change situation because we did get you know the 10 year this year a little bit less explosive than last year i mean uh, the, you know august september was pretty intense for the bond selling uh but last year when rates were extreme we did get a pretty big market crash so then what is kind of takeaway on the way the two interplay well, the first thing is we need to get sober about where the heck we are in the historic value of long-term, say, 10-year treasuries and mortgages. Okay. I can't believe how many times I hear that mortgage rates being at 7 or 8% are almost unaffordable. Most listeners out there, I think, uh, over 40 at least, will have some experience with mortgages that are greater than that. So that has been vastly overstated. And frankly, I think a 7 or 8% mortgage rate is more systemic of a um, normally operating economy. And for the past years, when we've had interest rates so low, that's really been an artificial environment. It's too bad that most people that are just now writing mortgages only have that short-term memory of say two or three percent mortgages so that's one of the main reasons why i think going forward if we have an eight nine percent mortgage rate next year for instance the market can still do exceedingly well as history has shown okay that's an interesting point uh, because there is this connection between housing and rates that's a, a little bit more concrete right than maybe the discounted cash flow uh, that you talked about with the tech assumptions, uh, housing mm. moving pretty close to it. But if we don't have to have a major breakdown in housing, that should be a pretty good pillar of support for the economy. Certainly it should be, but you know, that's not the only issue. I mean, the other issues are just look at the business uh, opportunities in this country, for instance. And when you look at themed investing, you know, earlier you asked me, well, what else worked? Well, uh, cybersecurity, I've been pounding the table for cybersecurity uh, long before COVID, for instance, and uh, that has endured quite, quite well. So for instance, Palo Alto Networks, CyberArk, companies that I know going forward, unless we have a total regime change in the way we protect our data and security, these companies are in it for the long run. Yeah, I see some of those at the top of the list of your holdings, uh, CyberArk in there, uh, mm. Palo Alto uh, as a percent of uh, holdings in your strategy, is that number one still? 
Uh, actually, it is, yes. And remember, I run a very concentrated portfolio, so it isn't for the weak of heart. I tell investors never to just invest in this as a core portfolio, but as we call a satellite portfolio. Currently, I only have 13 holdings. That's the most concentrated I have been in my career, but it also gives you a hint of how confident I am going forward in the economy. Well, that gives you the biggest hit so when you're concentrated. I've seen the data on that. Uh, once you get mm. past 20, it starts to look a little bit like an index. So uh, that's the way it to does, go. Yes. When it works, it works. So, uh, Peter, there's a few other things in there that uh, to kind of the uh, untrained eye, uh, perhaps one way to put it, doesn't fit with that kind of big growth perspective. United mm. Rentals is a stock that you like. Uh, yes. You do have a good bit of cash in there, too, as well. Uh, you've got a medical business in there, too. Where do you kind of get the cyclical? Cyclicality. If you're optimistic on the economy, is cyclicality yes. still best played through tech or is it worth dabbling in some traditional kind of industrial stuff? Very astute observation, Oliver. So uh, this all comes from the way I pick the stocks. I normally look at balance sheet and income statements, and that drives me to the stocks. So for instance, I'm not just a growth investor. I look at companies that if you're a bondholder, for instance, you would say, wow, these companies are doing fantastically well. Why doesn't the equity market know about these? And why aren't they rewarding the uh, great performance with stock improved prices? So that's how all those stocks that you're looking at, you might say, what is the secret sauce for finding these things? And I'm telling you, it is normally to think like a bondholder and look at these companies as if you are lending to them and ask yourself, are they doing well? So that's why you get companies like Cody Cosmetics, United Rental, for instance. They're not traditionally known as big growth players, but they have great balance sheets and prospects ahead of them. Okay. So uh, when you look for the uh, connection to the economy in these stocks, Peter, if uh, uh, growth does uh, slow down somewhat, if these GDP readings this week come in lighter than the last, we had that mm. big pop of almost 5%. A lot of people mm. arguing that was a flash in the pan. If it does mm. slow down, then oh, what do you think the market does in response? Well, you always have to look at this in a series of data, right? We are so accustomed now and conditioned to looking at every single print and feeling this pressure to make an immediate decision. And I never manage money that way. Instead, I look at a trend of data. So let's have this conversation, uh, say, a couple of quarters from now, when you say to me, look now, there is a trend showing of a decreasing growth. Then we start to pare back. However, I still think the, the consumer is in great uh, condition right now. And as the Fed has signaled, I, I'm thinking the Fed has signaled, a lot of people will disagree with me that they've uh, stopped raising rates. That tr provides a tremendous uh, launching ground for 2024. All right. Hey, uh, since we're pretty much done with the bulk of earnings, but we did just get NVIDIA, wanted to get your take kind of specifically on that stock, given your confidence in it. Uh, market kind of slowed down a little bit since the report after it made a fresh uh, closing high for NVIDIA. What do you think of the numbers? Should it be able to get to uh, and stay at these fresh records? I thought the numbers were fantastic, frankly. It uh, beat everybody's expectations. There was one little comment that most people picked up on about the slowdown in China. However, it was edited because the next phrase was expected to make up from other segments of the business. So that, I think, spooked us. And it also goes to show you how I'm kind of an island alone with the optimism. I think a lot of people are just not believing that this recovery has legs. And the second that they read something like that or they hear something, it's endemic of their insecurity. But I really think going forward, NVIDIA is the leader in artificial intelligence. And we're also seeing that it has workarounds with distributing its product to China. All right, Peter, thanks for the conversation. Nice uh, tone, energy, and optimism to kick off our week. You're welcome. All right, congrats on the year as well, Peter Anderson, Anderson Capital Management. All right, riding the big tech wave powered by the NASDAQ.